All right. So like I said in the introduction, I'm here with Saifedina Moose. And uh, today we are going to be talking about his new book, The Fiat Standard, which I have here. Amazing. Saifedina, amazing book, just like the first one. Um, this is my first question for you. Uh, these things are, these take a love <laughs> of education, writing. I mean, you are not doing this for yourself because this is so much work, right? When did you have the idea that you had another book in you? Because I mean, your first one was, in, in my opinion, was a smash hit success. Um, probably the biggest book in the entire space. Uh, with uh, the Bitcoin standard. So when did you realize, what were you thinking uh, when you were like, you know what, I think I'm going to do another one. What what was that moment? Um, I mean, to be fair, uh, like I always had the idea that I just can't get wait to get started on the second one. Um, I always wanted it. And in fact, I started with doing my textbook, Principles of Economics, I started doing that one first because I had had that idea for that book for a while. So like as soon as I saw the Bitcoin stand out and people were buying it, I just really thought, yep, yeah, this is what I should be doing. This is so much more enjoyable for me um, than being part of Fiat Academia <clears throat> and I should just do this full time. So I started immediately working on a course in uh, economics, which I taught at my website, and then I made it into uh, another uh, book, which is coming out in a few months. Uh, Principles of Economics, the textbook. But yeah, the idea for a follow-up was um, I also started writing initially for subscribers at an early point, um, like in late 2018. So some of the writing in this book was first sent out to subscribers in 2018, um, late 2018. So right after the Bitcoin standard had come out, um, I'd already started, you know, answering questions that people had asked me about the Bitcoin standard by writing these essays that I was sending to subscribers. And that kind of formed the genesis of the book. And then, um, you know, the, the main topic that I wanted to discuss was just how can Bitcoin rise in this fiat world? And what is fiat world going to do about it? How is fiat world going to react? Uh, are we going to have hyperinflation or is it have to be ugly? Does it maybe not have to be ugly? These are where the questions that kind of motivated me. And then what kind of brought it all together was at Baltic Honey Badger in Latvia a couple of years ago. Um, um, Giacomo Zucco gave a talk on uh, still manning altcoin apologia. So he um, went and you know made the case for altcoins, made the strongest case he could make for altcoins. And I thought that's a good way of approaching uh, um, my next book. You know, study the fiat standard. Um, as if you were writing the Bitcoin standard. Basically, give it the same Bitcoin standard treatment. So if you like the Bitcoin standard, um, let's take the same toolkit that we applied in that book. Take the same, you know, uh, capital equipment that we had to <laughs> try and understand Bitcoin from scratch and apply it to understanding fiat from scratch. And I thought this would be the best preparation for answering the question of, what happens in the clash of Bitcoin and fiat. Let's give fiat its own uh, kind of uh, Bitcoin standard treatment. Uh, think about it as an economic system, as a software system almost, because ultimately it is software. Um, you know, the vast majority of fiat is digital fiat. Uh, only a small percentage is in paper form. So it is a digital currency in a sense. And, um, you know, let's try and describe the, so the way that this software interacts with the real world with the meat space kind of like what i did with the bitcoin standard this is what i really liked about the book so um the terminology was uh bitcoin like terminology but it was easy for me to kind of really kind of wrap my head around how this very complex system works by thinking of it in those terms so um you at the beginning of the book you talk about there being four functions of a fiat node and you call it a node so um could you get into some of those various four functions that the fiat node has and kind of describe what you mean by fiat node 
Yeah, so I think, you know, drawing analogy between the Bitcoin network and fiat is a very productive way of coming at it because, you know, Bitcoin contains all of the um, minimum viable products for a monetary system because it's clearly worked for moving money around and maintaining a monetary policy for more than a decade now. So if you need to run those things, Bitcoin has the software infrastructure that you need for it. It has the structure to carry out these processes. So you can make analogy to it in other systems and that can help you separate the essential functional aspect of the fiat monetary system from the paraphernalia and the propaganda. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a very kind of uh, precise way of attacking the question of just, if this was Bitcoin, what would be a node? Who would be a miner? How does mining work? Um, the, these are really the main questions. And if you just try and answer these with relation to the uh, fiat network, you can then uh, understand, I think, <laughs> and decode a lot of the insanity you see around you in fiat world. I agree with you. And I like the, the way that you describe the miner in the book. So tell people who the miner is in this situation for the fiat system. Yeah, so most people imagine that fiat money is printed and it's still in the terminology. Most people still use the term. But in reality, the majority of fiat uh, money is digital. And the printing is not really the creation of new money. Printing is a process where, um, you know, after the money is created digitally, uh, a small fraction of it is printed in physical form. It's kind of immaterial to look at the printing. Where the mining of fiat really happens is in the creation of debt because fiat money is basically debt fiat money is debt that is guaranteed by government these are the tokens of the fiat network so anybody can mine a new token for the fiat network by uh, getting a lending license from uh, the central bank government uh, bastard entity that is the fiat note you know the the central bank granted is granted a monopoly by the government to be the only one that issues money and in exchange the central bank buys government bonds that's the kind of elaborate song and dance how this node works so you end up with really one full node in the system per country but arguably there's only really one full node in the entire world which is the federal reserve and there are you know all the other kind of central banks are um uh, in a sense uh, subordinate nodes to the full node in bitcoin you could say that um they're not really full nodes there's only one full node because you know it's the only entity that can decide on how many tokens there are in the system and it's the only entity that can um, annul and control any particular transaction so your entire country could be wiped off, uh, taken off the fiat network if your entire country pisses off the U.S. Federal Reserve. And it has happened. Um, so, you know, somebody in your government says something stupid and then suddenly you and your 90 million uh, co-citizens are <laughs> kicked off the fiat network. It's very different from Bitcoin. You can just run your own Bitcoin node and nobody can kick you out. Um, but... With fiat, it's really one full node and it decides on monetary policy. It decides on what the transactions work. And then we have, um, if you look at the different kinds of subordinate nodes, so there's the, like the central banks, but then there's the private banks, which are really the mining node, the private banks and the um, central bank guaranteed financial institutions, all the financial institutions that basically function in the uh, white economy, um, everything that's uh, legalized by the local central bank is essentially guaranteed by the local central bank and so it can issue credit and that's how they mine money and so when you think about it this way when you think about the proof of work as being generated finding somebody who's willing to take on to take your money basically that's you know in <laughs> bitcoin you need to solve the proof of work problem you need to apply all of that uh, machine power in order to try and figure out the answer to the correct uh, the correct answer to the proof of work problem in mining fiat you need to find somebody to take your money and promise to pay you back that's then, it if you do, do that <laughs> and yes it, yeah. and if you do that you don't give them your money you just make new money that's the amazing thing about it like this is how it works once a bank finds a borrower for a million dollars for a house they make a million dollars. You know, they get the block reward, which in this 
case is a million dollars. It's whatever the lender will take. Basically, you create that money out of thin air. Now, you know, you have other assets in return uh, backing it. You have collateral, but that's extremely getting thinner and thinner as a part of the business operation that essentially all these entities are doing is just lending out money. So that's really how the money is being created. And now you can see why there's a very strong incentive for people to borrow. I think that's really what explains the debt. Uh, really, the best way to understand the insane uh, amount of debt that happens in the monetary system in the fiat world is to understand that mining fiat happens through borrowing. Everyone is always coming up with reasons to borrow and lend. So I love this point. And when you were making it in the book, I was like, oh my God, this is so good because you're getting at the essence of the incentive structure. And when you're, when you're talking about that incentive for them to mine via issuing more debt, you, you start to think, okay, so as, as a group collectively, as everybody gets in debt up to their eyeballs, like what's their next play? Well, their next play is they have to start dropping rates or rates have to go down in order for them to continue to issue even more or mine more to put it into the system. And so it's like, I'm thinking about this and I'm like, holy hell, like everything's just going further out on the risk curve, right? Like it's just incentivizing the entire system to go further and further in debt, further and further out on the risk curve to employ newly issued currency into the system. It was just, it was such a great, um, you lay it out so clear in the book. It was just amazing. I, I was so impressed with it. Um, one of the things that you did, uh, probably about halfway through the book, you had mentioned um, something that really surprised you through writing this, um, that you found uh, fiat actually did serve a purpose for one specific thing. Um, and that's prob that, that had a lot to do with how it kind of rose to existence over the last hundred years. So um, tell us what that is, and then tell us if there was anything else that you kind of uncovered or surprised you uh, through writing the book. Yeah, I, mean, I have to say I tried to give fiat as fair a hearing as possible. You know, I tried to imagine it that it was an altcoin, and I'm trying to be charitable for this altcoin. In a sense, I was trying to think of if I was writing the fiat white paper and trying to get to sell people on this piece of malware, what would be the selling points? And I think, to be fair, you know, the, the, the main selling point is saleability across space. And this is kind of the thing that um, complements the analysis of the Bitcoin standard. And the Bitcoin standard are focused on saleability across time. So how gold or fiat hold their value across time. And I came at that book from the perspective of a gold bug, really, who just... Um, would only see the massive injustice and fraud that is involved in uh, fiat currency, which I think is uh, very true. But I think kind of misses the point that the reason that this was even possible is because moving gold around was extremely expensive. Now, in, in, in the pre-Bitcoin era, this was something that us pre-Bitcoiners took for granted. You know, I speak as somebody who was a gold bug uh, pretty late into life. Um, it's, 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 it's something that's, uh, it's very difficult to think about it being the other way, you know, you're, you're going to have to be moving money around anyway. And so you might as well move gold, which is the most dense and the most valuable. And it, it is impeccable logic. It makes a lot of sense, but because it is so expensive, governments were able to just basically shut this down and make it prohibitively expensive on any kind of scale that allows for the development of a monetary network. Like you can't just run a Bitcoin bank, uh, a gold bank, and move money across the world. It doesn't really happen that way um, for various reasons. And, you know, I didn't get much into the history. I tried to focus on it in terms of, you know, just how it works. Um, and the reality is people can't get around that. It's very expensive to move your gold around. It's really expensive. There's a limit on how much you can carry with you on an airplane. If you want to send it with... Um, couriers, it's also very expensive. It's, uh, it, th there's no banking clearance mechanism that can function around gold. And so moving gold around was expensive. And it was pretty expensive during the end of the gold standard. So you look at the, and, and the be beginning of the book is a little bit historical. I'm looking at the episode of the World War I, when the UK went off the gold standard, 
you see there that the you know they were moving gold to the u.s in order to finance the war and they were moving mountains and mountains of gold and it was pretty darn expensive like moving that gold around is not an easy thing to pull off and on the other hand once they kind of upgraded the entire system to be based on the credit of the sovereign that gold could move around much quicker so in terms of being able to move value around in the fiat system across space it is faster than gold and that's i think the, the kind of grudging thing that the gold bugs need to start to admit that their money loses the, the gold is good at not losing value across time but fiat is good at not losing value across space try and send your gold bar gold bars across the, uh, the atlantic you lose quite a bit of the, their uh, face value which is uh, which, which is a serious problem that governments have shown that you know they can make that happen it's been the case for over a century it's 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 entirely possible for them so that really i think makes us understand the benefit of fiat and then that sets up the kind of interesting question about the, the framing of the question about how fiat and bitcoin um will interact because um it, it it kind of shapes the way that we we view the the path that the two of them take because ultimately whether bitcoin is going to be able to um resist the forces of fiat depends on how gold-like it is in its centralization and its ability to keep things moving around the world and so we can look at the you know we can look at the bar that gold set and we say that we can say that that's not uh workable which is you had to spend somewhere around half a percentage point of the uh, face value of your gold to send it across the atlantic so bitcoin really has to kind of beat that and i think it has a lot of headway and room for growth without coming near uh that price point because we can just move enormous amounts of value on bitcoin already and it's very future ready in terms of being able to move more and more value particularly with all the scaling solutions that you see developing all over and all the financial infrastructure that's around it so it i, I think you know thinking about it from this perspective is uh, what's important toward thinking about bitcoin security against the fiat system so one of the things that you wrote in the book that I thought was, I'm so glad that you put it in there, uh, was this idea of inflation as a vector. And this is something that I know Michael Saylor, and that's who you attribute in the book to, to the idea. And um, I mean, you can't find this anywhere in academia, anybody talking about inflation as a vector. <laughs> Vectors are too complicated for them. You know, they're doing high level physics math, but they don't like to think about CPI as a vector. It has to be a number. Talk to us about this idea so people understand what that means and uh, why it's important to kind of economic calculation. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Giacomo Zucco may have sparked the fire for writing this book, like he gave me the idea of how to motivate it, but the one that uh, applied the finishing touches to it, or the one that really that uh, provided the glue that held it all together, that put all, put all of the puzzle pieces together on the board, was hearing Michael Saylor talk about uh, inflation as a vector, because that's something that, you know, you can see all of this money printing happening all the, all the time. And yet, you know, you have to get into arguments with uh, fiat people about the definition of the CPI. And, you know, how, how dare you not trust the experts? Uh, <laughs> and, you know, they're going to call you a conspiracy theorist for not believing in government statistics on uh, price inflation. And I think, you know, the, 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 there's so many ways in which you understand that the CPI is wrong. And, I, and you know, I, I list them in the book and I discuss just how ridiculous the whole concept is. But I think um, the, the, the way of expressing it that Michael provided, which is the idea to think about it in terms of it as being as a vector, and then think about the different kinds of goods and the differences between the goods and how they react in that way. And so you see that with digital goods, 
inflation, price inflation, if you want to define it as such, if you want to say price inflation, the changes in prices with digital goods is maybe negative 10, 20, maybe 50% per year. You know, things just keep getting cheaper. Your Google storage goes up, uh, the speed of your connection goes up, and all of this stuff just getting cheaper. For the same amount of dollars that you're paying, you're getting better quality and all of that stuff. And of course, that stuff is included heavily in the CPI calculations. You know, if your if your laptop got faster, <laughs> the central bank needs to print more money to make up for the <laughs> deflationary damage that your laptop is doing. So when you're when you're putting it all into a, into one number, you're throwing in first. You know, you have your computer um, uh, processing power, and then we also have you know the industrial. Uh, cheap trinkets that are produced at very mass scale, you know, cheap plastic thing for which really the vast majority of the cost is uh, just uh, divided over many large um, number of goods. So the price there is kind of immaterial. It's very small and there's very little inflation on it because these things can just be cranked up. You know, when there's inflation, people want to spend more because, you know, people don't want to hold on to cash. So they start buying more uh, stupid plastic trinkets. And these things um, demand increases for them, but you know, the stupid plastic uh, trinket printer just goes burr. It's very easy to get it to go to burr basically and to fight the inflation that happens on it. They do have the equivalent of <laughs> the central bankers monetary policy and that the people who run these plastic factories just ramp, ramp them up on the weekends and they can um, meet your increased uh, monetary availability with more plastic trinkets you don't need. But uh, then you look at food and you see with food and you see the same kind of uh, idea with the cheap industrial food, it's easy to crank it up at volumes. And so you witness lower inflation there. But with um, nutritious um, food, it becomes more and more complicated. And if you wanted to get good quality, nutritious food, you know, if you wanted the kind of good quality eggs that most American could expect in the 60s and 70s, just as par for the course. If you want them today, you have to pay a lot extra. The price of these things has gone up much more than just inflation. And so, and then you see like there is the, um, because these things are much harder to um, industrialize. You know, there's still the element of the cow that needs to spend a lot of time out there grazing and eating and uh, getting sunshine. You can't make easy shortcuts around it like you can with processed food. Then you get to the highly desirable goods, you know, like Miami Beach real estate. Now look at the inflation rate on that. And when you think about it this way, you see that, yeah, like the CPI is low if you choose to focus your um, consumption on uh, digital goods and on cheap plastic trinkets and um, industrial food. And not coincidentally, you so you also see a lot of um, government science that recommends that you head in that direction. You don't need to consume as a recession, and of course you need to have your junk food in balanced moderation, and uh, you need to just always be spending to keep the economy going. Um, <laughs> so, so this is the part of the book that I was just like. Oh, so this is how it works when you got into the academia part. So I've just looked at the whole journaling piece and the the funding and and never really kind of pieced it together on like how the the institutions, the academic institutions are really incentivized. My God, you made it crystal clear in this book. Explain to people, just give people a little like idea of like how that Rube Goldberg Rube Goldberg machine of um, funding flows into these academic institutions and how they're incentivized to produce these journal articles <laughs> to get through this process with people. Yeah, and I speak from bitter experience. You know, I was a victim of the academic fiat mill for pretty much most of my life until I, you know, Bitcoin set me free. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Bitcoin standard really set me free. Um, so the way that it works, I think, is, you, again, you, you once you understand it from the perspective of fiat, it all kind of lights up because fiat is, you know, the underlying technology behind fiat academia. It's 
what shapes the entire method of interaction that happens. And the key thing here is what happens if we apply an infinite money printer at the top of science and just open the spigots of money printing. And we see it happening um, in, you know, as I was saying earlier, if you think about it in terms of inflation as a vector, so let's leaving off of the, um, picking up where we left off of the previous question, you know, there is an enormous amount of motivation and incentive for governments to try and emphasize on the, consu to emphasize the consumption of the goods that are easy to make away from the goods that are um, quite price sensitive. And um, you can see how this is reflected across the board in all kinds of industries. You can see it in the food industry. And we just have so many vivid examples of, you know, the Department of Agriculture is out there trying to make food cheap in the 1970s. You know, I wonder why, what might have happened in 1970 uh, to make all the 1970s about making food cheaper. And, you know, you look at how they did that and the methods that they did as well. It was all about industrialization because that was about bringing the cost down. So they sacrificed the nutrient quality because of this. And then, of course, you have an enormous incentive for academia to go along with this. And so academia is just churning out one piece of horrible diet advice after the other for the past almost 50 years now. You know, uh, everything from the cholesterol scare and the uh, idea that, you know, you need to eat uh, six to 10 rations of grain per day and that industrial produced uh, industrial waste is good for you in moderation and that everything is fine in moderation and that you know um, you know animal meat is all really not essential and you should look to getting uh, plant meats so there's an enormous incentive for this and that's where all the funding comes from like there's no free market in academia and science and so ideas don't live and die by their success on the free market ideas live and die by their ability to secure and generate funding. So I use the example of food, which I think has become, all right, people have been laughing at it for three years, but almost everybody has laughed at it now to the point where it's become kind of familiar. And I think people are beginning to um, admit defeat on that one, that yeah, clearly there is something wrong in the idea that we should tell people to eat this poison and that they should worry about cholesterol and so not eat fatty meats and instead eat industrial waste. Yes, clearly there's something wrong here. It clears a lot of um, benefit from it to be made in the fiat world, both from you know, companies that provide this, but also from the governments that want to in, um, understate inflation. But then apply the same framework for the rest of academia. And then the rest of academia starts to make sense. The the way it would work in a free market, you would imagine, is that you know anybody can publish whatever they want, and then people who are able to publish things and write things and teach things that are well rewarded in the market will get more customers and will be able to grow and scale, and um, they'll basically command the market. This is how it works in free markets, but that's not how academia works. And um, if you look at academia, there's very little kind of innovation happening about it. I think, you know, one interesting aspect to think about is that, um, you know, as it has gotten, and Michael Saylor says this, and he's absolutely correct on it, as it has gotten see, uh, cheaper to uh, make education, you see like all these major universities, they're not making it, they're, they're not prioritizing scaling and teaching more people. They're prioritizing remaining exclusive. This has been the case. And therefore, it's much more about the credentials than it is about the education. But it goes far beyond that because the majority of the money that they get, that these universities get, are either uh, are from the fiat spigot, basically from the fiat printers. And it either arrives in the form of government research grants or in the form of uh, credit for tuition for students studying in your university. So basically on both ends, the customer really is the government. So on both ends, the government is politicizing the way that fiat academia works because it is paying the piper. So it is calling the tune. So you then think about this and um, you know, if, if you look at modern academia, like you, you, I know you study a lot of um, investors and you're very well informed about the literature on investment, just not, not just in the Bitcoin world, but also in the uh, TradFi world. Um, like how often do you and people like you and general investors, how often do you look into academic journals? 
Never. Absolutely. Never. Absolutely never. And in fact, <laughs> when I see them, I, I almost roll my eyes like that's probably the last place I want to look for like sound information. <laughs> Right. Because, I mean, just like the cap M model is a perfect example in the finance space, at least for like doing economic calculation. I'm just I'm looking at this model and I'm saying there's no way I would ever invest my money <laughs> with this model. Like this model's so broke. <laughs> right. But you, it, but that's almost like the the gold standard for anything that's going to get published out of academia on how you conduct a calculation is the volatility of these other things compared to this thing. And over this set duration that you just plucked out of thin air right it just doesn't make any sense yeah and i think um you know the the experience is shared across all kinds of different disciplines like really i think if you're reading nutrition science you're probably wasting your time a lot of that is just such an enormous time waste and i think the same is true in economics and finance and in all kinds of different fields because the key thing the key point i think is that in fiat academia, the, there is no cost to getting things wrong. There is a cost to not publishing. My God, you couldn't say that any better. You, That's what it comes down to. You have to get published, and you don't have to be right. It doesn't matter what you write. You just have to get it past the editor. So, again, there's no market feedback. There's nobody actually reading this stuff and making real decisions on it and then saying, you know, those guys helped me and those guys didn't help me and then a market learning process emerging from this. It's just about really get it out it, the door. It's like you're <laughs> getting it out of the door. It's like selling vegetables. You know, you're just, you, you need to get this many pounds through the door every, every week. It's like you're a pizza place and you just have to hand out these pizzas and you have to put these papers in these journals. And so if you look at these journals, this is, this is how the thing works. So the fiat spigot comes from the top to the universities. And the fiat journals have basically captured the system. They're like the real parasites in the system. <laughs> what they've done is they've managed to suck on the host. The hosts are the universities. And by having their people, which are the administrators in the universities, taking it over while the uh, professors and nerds are just basically busy trying to focus on their own topic, what the uh, corporate fiat cancer has done and the parasites have done in the system is that they've channeled the majority of the money to these uh, journals that produce garbage that absolutely nobody in the entire world reads, reads yeah. except people looking into getting into that into writing <laughs> more into writing more articles for more journals. Right? Exactly. And it's yeah. either, you know, the people who want to become the parasites in the system or the people who are volunteering to be the, uh, you know, the prey in the system. They're, they're volunteering to be the host. Like, yeah, how, where do I sign up so that I could spend my life writing papers so that, um, you know, all these journals would make money on my behalf? Like they make obscene amounts of money and it is all in copyright and, um, um, you know, in publishing for this um uh, it's all on the copyright, so it's not even accessible. So they get the funding, the money, they get it from universities that get the funding from governments, but still they don't share their work because, you know, and I think they do that as a favor for the professors because if more people could get behind those journals and read the kind of nonsense that's in them, um, <laughs> there'd be a massive problem for the uh, uh, reputation of the uh, academic mafia. But so they do it, they hide these and they charge, they charge exorbitant amounts of money to sell them but they don't care about the retail market of you and me signing up one day to buy a $30 article. The point there is to dis d deter people and then force the universities to pay enormous amounts of money for these journals. So it's, it's so perverse. They get the university professors to do this work for free. So all the university professors, you know, in order to get ahead in your job, and, you know, I'm, I'm extremely grateful that I was extremely slacking in my job because I did very little of that um, while I was learning about Bitcoin. Um, but they get you to write journals, articles. You don't get paid for publishing in them. And they need you to uh, referee the journals and review the readings and edit the journals. So they have an enormous number of academics who are just their slaves who are working there. And then the academics produce the journal and then the universe and, and then those publishers will sell the universities, the same universities where the same academics worked, they will sell them the journal subscription for obscene amounts of money. 
And that's basically how the academic mafia works. And that's why you can't take academic publications seriously. They're not produced with, because their content matters. They're produced to be grammatically correct, politically correct, and then to just get volumes of paper down the line. And now it's all, almost all digital. But still, like, you know, uh, when I was um, considering applying for promotion as an academic, like they give you a list of journals and there's an enormous number of journals out there. It's, 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 it's beyond your imagination. Like it's, 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 it's incredible how many journals there are in, the broad, in, in every single field. And they're just churning out articles that are being read by the academics for the academics. And um, well, they just go into a repository right, that are then searched for the next journal that's being written. And since those are the only creditable sources that can be used by any academic writing, it goes into this repository that just, like, turns into this giant self-licking ice cream cone that yes. licks itself, right? <laughs> like it's Yes. It's, they're, they're providing absolutely no value to the outside world. They're churning out this relevant nonsense and they're miseducating people by just teaching them basic propaganda um, in, in most topics. But also, like the incentive in order to publish, I think it gets even more perverse. There's the idea that it is all nonsense, but there's, I think, it's more perverse than that because it's worse than just nonsense. There's also a very strong incentive for it to be um, always driven towards panic and scare and hysteria because that's how you get published you can't get published and you can't get you know paper buckets through the door of these journal um, subscribing universities without creating important issues that require more money for research so if you come along and you say well i've looked into this thing and it seems fine to me well that's the end of your academic career more or less Whereas if you look into anything and you realize, oh my God, this is an existential threat that's going to ruin the world as we know it, you're more likely to get more research funding. There's no market test. You're not punished for being wrong. Hey, Safe. So in, in your book, you get into uh, shadow banking. This is, this is a term that I know I hear all the time uh, being thrown, thrown around. Help us understand what, it, what the term means and then Tell us kind of where it fits into the overall process, the whole fiat process. Yeah, so I think the key thing here is that um, traditionally the way that banks created money was through lending and that would happen, you know, you go to your deposit bank, you'd uh, take a personal loan from your deposit bank and then they create money. And today that kind of still happens, but that's responsible for very little money compared to what's going on in non-FDIC insured banking sector. So I think the distinction here is that the, um, the FDIC insured institutions are the uh, regular banking system. And then everything that's doing banking outside of the FDIC is kind of the shadow bank. And it's an interesting kind of negative term, even though the industry is enormous and it's a very large number of people who are doing this business today. But it is kind of a shadow of the banking system because it's doing banking without an FDIC license. Um, so, um, and I think this is basically, uh, this is where the money creation is happening. This is where all the fun finance stuff is happening. You know, the, like your local regional bank is out of the fun uh, fiat games. They barely create any money. They compared to the amount of money that's being produced by uh, large financial institutions in the shadow banking system. So I think um, this is, uh, you know, fiat initially, the first problem with fiat with the implementation of the fiat standard was the fact that banks failed. And so they then fixed that with FDIC insurance, but then they took um, fractional reserve banking outside of the FDIC short, uh, um, institutions gradually and slowly. And so now that's where all of the real banking is happening in the shadow banking system. Uh, one of the one of the other terms that I think people hear all the time, they know the organization is there, but they might not necessarily fully understand how it functions along with this fiat system is the IMF. So help people understand why the IMF exists, um, what it does yeah. and, and what its role is in the overall uh, global economy. Yeah, so this was, I think, at some point, I, I hesitated to include this chapter, but it was one of the earliest chapters that I wrote for this book. And um, it almost felt like it needed its own book, but I felt it must be included because this was kind of really 
central to the uh, just uh, entire analysis of applying this kind of fiat mining uh, perspective to global banking and global central banking and then thinking about the implications of that and uh, yeah when uh, the, the the big thing here is that the IMF is the world's central bank so the IMF is basically the US government's Incidentally, very few people know this, but the IMF is, is essentially a U.S. government agency. It is funded by the United Nations with a grant uh, from Congress. So it is um, a United Nations agency, and it is uh, it, it has a uh, credit line to the Federal Reserve in order to you know stabilize global market. But what that has effectively made it is the world central bank. So it lends to central banks when central banks are in trouble. You know, central bank nodes are always creating debt. And just like banks are always creating debt and they're always inflating the money supply and they always run into problems. And then that's the kind of uh, very strong centralizing check that continues to ensure that the, you know, the side nodes have to kiss the knee of the central node is that they always face a bailout threat. And so they always have to kiss the ring. And so that's kind of how the uh, system works. So as a result, really, the IMF and the World Bank have ended up becoming something like um, a global bureaucracy that runs the world. And I think um, to think about it from the perspective of uh, economics, from just the implications of this, like you have very strong tendency for central planning in very primitive economies that have not accumulated significant amount of capital. So you're taking away the a, a very large amount of the resources it's a, already a small country with a small economy with very small resources and you're putting that in in the hands of basically graduates from uh, halfway around the world who don't know anything about the country but they're there you know to build the road network and then you know guess what this doesn't work and so you know what what you, what fixes this is more debt and a new expert who's going to tell you how to spend this new money now. And, you know, obviously the, there's enough blame to go around with the local governments and with the international experts and with the international organizations. And I must admit, like with the continuous revisions of this draft, I've tended to move away from the kind of bile and anger against those people and to try and to just think constructively because um, ultimately, Thinking about it just in terms of incentives, you've been unleashing a force of central planning for the past 60 years that is constantly destroying capital, constantly destroying the currency, constantly destroying ability of people to save and putting all savings in the hands of unelected bureaucrats from halfway around the world and um, subjecting the entire country to the basic uh, complete command of the US. And um, obviously, you know, in uh, fireworks resulted everywhere this has been tried you know everywhere has been having inflation and uh, everywhere has been having uh, financial crises and economic crises all the time and yet um it just continues and people just take it as a, a, a normal thing and it's an unquestioning thing and i think this is one of the most pernicious things about the fiat standard just how much um it has subverted politics all over the world to um this game of power for control of the local fiat printer under the auspices of the uh, central fiat uh, node. Yeah, when you when you take a step back and you're just like looking at all participants in the world and what proportion of them are in debt up to their eyeballs and literally own nothing but uh, have tons of debt. I mean, it's it's slave labor. It's uh, you know, when I look back in history and I see things like uh, the the pyramids and you're thinking, how in the world, how many slaves would they have to have in order to build and construct something like that? And then I compare it to today. People just don't realize that they're the slave. They don't realize that they're so in debt. There's no way they're ever going to pay it off in their entire lifetime. They're, they're just going to have to continue to borrow more. And it's it's a function of the system that you're describing. And wow, what what a what a crazy <laughs> uh, point we are in history when you look at that 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 uh, what's the word I'm looking for um, composition of participants in the system, and you would say, hey, what is it? Ninety percent of them are never going to escape the the debt trap that they're in. I don't know what that number is, but I suspect it's just unbound. 
way higher than people realize. Yeah, but, yeah, but you know, writing this book made me realize that, I mean, in a sense, it's almost not that bad. Like, you almost have to be in debt. In fact, um, it's the successful winning move in the fiat standard. Like, the way to accept, the way to understand this game is that you win in this game by accumulating the biggest negative balance that you can get. Like, you just need to keep borrowing larger amounts of money. That's how you win. You borrow larger amounts of money and then you use them to acquire larger amounts equity. of hard assets. Yeah. Exactly. Equity, real estate, uh, you know, all of the things that are witnessing very high amounts of price inflation in the inflation vector, all of the things that essentially are, <laughs> you're told that you shouldn't uh, acquire. Um, that promises a higher yield than the interest rate that you're, fixed rate interest rate that you're paying on the, on the borrowing. So, Exactly. And the thing is, the more you borrow, the more credit worthy you become, the better interest rate you get. So it's just a game where you need to get into more debt. Like Michael Saylor was really very important for me understanding because the Saylor strategy was like the logical conclusion of what I was getting at in the fiat standard, which I was kind of unable to really articulate. And then Michael Saylor comes along and it's just exactly, yep, this is it. This is how you win the fiat standard. This is how you win in this game. You keep stacking more assets and borrowing against them. And then you get to borrow more at a lower price because you've got better credit and then you stack more assets. And as he says it himself, he said it on my podcast, uh, you know, you get better at the, um, you get better at the debt game. You just, the, the goal of life is to die in debt. You want to die, you just keep uh, accumulating more and more debt. It continues to get devalued. You accumulate harder assets. That's what rich people do. And if you think about it, yeah, that's it. It's about figuring out how to manage debt. And um, I think that's, that's very important financial uh, information for most people that uh, everything decent in life tells you should not be true. Like everything, every logical thing, your grandma, everything, everyone tells you, you know, you shouldn't get into debt. You should accumulate savings. You should have savings for a, a rainy day. And, uh, you know, you should not uh, spend money that you don't have. And it makes sense. Like, it's, it, it's not natural for people to do this. It's, it's, it's not the natural order of life for any living organism to be in debt. It's, you want to have an excess. You want to be producing and accumulating excesses. As humans, you know, we accumulate capital. We, we, this is civilization. Civilization has always been the process of accumulating more capital and accumulating higher and larger savings and passing them on. And... Um, this is really kind of the uh, in-your-face subtitle of the book. It's the alternative to human civilization. Like, it's really a system where we're all debt slaves, and we stop accumulating capital, and um, you know we consume away uh, global civilization and descend back to our ancestors' standards of living because we consume all of our uh, capital, we consume all of our corn seed effectively. And we start going hungry and we go back to our ancestors' uh, living standards. We get rid of all this modern technology that we're doing. We're seeing it happen, you know, in, in, in industrial technology with oil and all of that stuff, with fiat essentially trying to mandate the essential oils that we need for survival away. And uh, it's a decline in living standard uh, if, if we keep doing it. Like you can win this game if you manage to borrow at a lower interest rate and accumulate more capital and always make payments, but you're highly uncertain at all times. That's the thing. Like That's the price that even successful people will have to pay in this game, which is that you're always two paychecks away from everything blowing up in your face. Um, six paychecks, whatever. But you know, the safer, the, the bigger margin of safety you have, the more you lose track in this game. Like, <laughs> you win by gambling recklessly. Um, so, you have to leave yourself, uh, you have to basically leave yourself insecure or you're not taking enough risk. You're losing in the game. So, it's a, it, it, it's a horrific thing, I think, overall. Like, yes. So, when I do a cost benefit analysis, all right, yes, we do get savings in terms of, you know, it's cheaper to move things around with fiat than it is with gold. But here's the upside. Here's the complete, you know, um, uh, here's the complete upside estimate, widely optimistic estimate of how much that costs us. You know, moving all this gold around is not going to cost more than half a percent of global wealth. Well, let's look at what fiat costs us by putting all of the power to print money in the hands of governments that promise they're going to be nice about it. Well, let's look at the report card. We've got 100 years now. Let's look at the last 60. We've got strong data from the World Bank over the last 60 years for the increase of M2 every year across the world. 
So we see the average, the numerical average for the whole, all the world's currencies is uh, 32%. But the weight average for all currencies by market value, so that you know you don't give equal weighting to the US dollar and the Venezuelan uh, Bolivar, so that the Venezuelan Bolivar's inflation is only to the size of its own, uh, is only weight to the size of the Venezuelan economies, the Venezuelan uh, shitcoins uh, market value. And the dollar is weighed much more. In that kind of scenario, you see that the average inflation in the last 60 years was about 14%. So about 14% is the average fiat user experience. Uh, put the random, you know, pick an average fiat user, put them in average fiat country in the period 1960 to 2015. And this is even before 1970. So we're putting in the good years of the 60s, which were still pretty inflationary, even though they were supposedly on the gold standard. But um, you, you you get 14%, which means basically your money loses half of its value in five years. Like that's that's the kind of, that's the effect. The governments can say all kinds of different noises about this stuff, but that's the reality of it. This is what they've done. This is the track record. This is you know you, you like and that's before you know, the, the fiat tax. That's before taxes. Yeah, fourteen. We're just talking about the currency. Yeah, yeah. We're just talking about the currency. You know, we we, we can listen to. Uh, fiat devs and their social media influencers and all of their um, uh, <laughs> altcoin propaganda and we we can give it all the kind of attention that it needs at some point we have to just you know stop listening to those shitcoiners and just look at the project what it does like the, if everybody has enormous estimates about their transaction per second and about their security until their network you know hits a critical bug and then you start listening to the Bitcoin maximalists <laughs> who, who told you in the first place. Well, let's really look at it. Like in terms of fiat, what is the um, what 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 does it actually do? Yes, it does save us on the move with money around, but it gives us fourteen percent increase in supply on average. So even if you look at the best cases of fiat, you know the best implementations were tried in countries like the U.S., Switzerland, Sweden, and Denmark. Those are like the four best, lowest average value of inflation. They get something like seven percent per year, which is still like ten years to lose fifty percent of your money. That's still very fast uh, devaluation of the value of your money, uh, or just you know an increase in the supply, which is going to be reflected differently in different goods. But still, that's pretty bad. Uh, you know, gold could do two percent. So the enormous role I think that money plays, which I mentioned in this book and I mentioned in the Bitcoin standard a little bit, and I discuss in more detail in my next book in the principles of economics, is that the hardness of money is like a control knob of time preference. That's, I think, the kind of conclusion from my two books and, and the principles of economics. That really, the harder the money is, the more we can save for the future, the better our money is holding on, the better the money is for holding to its value for the future, the more we are likely to plan for the future, the more we are likely to give attention to the future, the less we discount the future. In other words, the lower our time preference. The more civilized as human beings we become, the more savings we have, the more capital we can accumulate, the more capital we can buy, the more capital goods we can have. And that's really the process of civilization, of going from trying to catch fish with your hands to catching fish with a giant trawler that catches much higher number of fish per work and feeds many, many, many thousands more people uh, per hour of work uh, produced. So. We have a constant increase in the process of production under capitalism because we're constantly lowering our price, uh, lowering our time preference, that I mean. And I think that is essentially linked to the ability of the person who produces to be able to save their money in, uh, to, to be able to save their value in the money that holds on to its value. Well, if they lose that, they don't have a lot of time for work and production and they can't save and they can't accumulate real capital and you witness capital destruction. You witness the reversal of the process of civilization. And that's what I think fiat is doing. That's the kind of um, big takeaway from the book, that fiat is essentially a reversal of the human civilization process. We're destroying the value of the money, destroying people's ability to provide for their future. We're making provision. This is the thing that Keynesian idiots don't get. Like they tell you, well, you just invest and you beat Bitcoin. Uh, sorry, you invest and you beat inflation. But investment is a job on its own. Whatever it is that you need to beat inflation is a job.
job on its own that you didn't have to do as a gold user. You know, in, in the gold protocol, you got paid in a gold coin and you kept that gold coin and it had value in it and that value stayed there. It just it, it stayed in that coin for many, many years later. You know, many decades later, you could always go back to that coin and it would have that value. So that allowed you to earn extra money, let's say, this year and put it aside for 10 years from now, for 20 years from now, for your house that you were planning on building in 10 years. You could always save and you could always expect the gold would hold on to its value. And gold has held on to its value throughout centuries. And continues to do, even though I think, you know, it's kind of getting demonetized, but that's besides the point. But the point is, when you had gold as money, people were able to get that. Now with fiat, you can't get that. In order to be able to beat inflation, you have to go head to head with Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan and, you know, Preston Pish and all these people who spent a lot of time spending a lot of effort and energy into this, that it's basically really almost like a full-time job this is the thing like it's fiat needs to be earned twice like with 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 gold you earned your money and stayed earned with fiat you have to take it to the casino of fiat markets and you have to understand you know an enormous amount of economics and finance and you know you need to know what real estate's uh, market is like in your area and you should look into real estate in other areas you need to look at the commodities you need to look at those other worlds uh other countries central Man. banks it's crazy. You got to be a master of risk management, right? And economic calculation, yes. which is your second point. And that's a job. That's a job. Yeah. That's a job. Yeah. Full time job. Like most people, you know, I think, you know, people can't invest capital anymore because they don't have savings. And so investment is daunting. And investment, of course, involves a lot of pitfalls. Like, you know, people will say, well, you can just do uh, index investing. Still, there's a lot of fees. Inflation is very high. And still figuring out that you can just do inflation index investing is not an easy conclusion to arrive at. There's a million other people out there telling you that real estate is the right answer. Bitcoin is the right answer. This or that is the right answer. There's no easy way around it. And doing it means that you... Um, not just it's an effect on the amount of capital that you lose, but you're also losing labor time because you're not able to be a good doctor because you have to figure out what the hell the Bank of Japan is going to do next week in order to figure out where to put your savings and what to do with your stocks and your bonds and your commodities and all of this incredibly complex portfolio that you have. That's time taken away from your excellence as a doctor or as an athlete or as any kind of job, you know, um, unless you do this as a job, as a business. You really, I, I think, you know, you would benefit enormously from just having a form of money where you could expect 2 3% appreciation per year. I think with current productivity, it would be much higher than it was under the gold standard, maybe 3 maybe 4 maybe 5 even percent per year increase if you wanted to think about an average price, although that's a problematic concept, but similar to... It, it would constantly go up and you could still invest, of course, but, you know, you'd have a lot more time and a lot more ease uh, to come at the investment that you understand in the time you understand with the amount of money that you can risk and not constantly have a gun behind you, you know, forcing you to invest your money or lose it. So in your book, um, you have a whole section here about the fiat cost benefit analysis, which you were getting into there. Um, I'm just going to, yeah. I'm going to read the four things so people know, um, what they, what they are. And I loved how you went through, this is a little bit different than, you know, when I read the title of the chapter, I was thinking, oh, this is going to get interesting. Cause I, I suspected you were going to get into like the cost of energy to mine and Bitcoin and compare it to fiat. And you didn't, you went, you went in a different way that I thought was extremely thoughtful. And so these were the four main points. The first one, which is the one you were talking about was the destruction of holders' wealth through inflation. You talked about the M2 weighted is 14%, which is mind-blowing to me. It doesn't surprise me, but hearing that number and knowing that you went and calculated that was really uh, quite interesting to me. The second uh, cost-benefit analysis was the destruction of economic calculation, which we were getting into a little bit there where you were talking about um, just how hard it is for a person to go out there and try to do all this these risk calculations to just protect their savings, right? Of the work that they've already performed. Uh, the third one was control to government to shape uh, the economy and society. And then the fourth one was increased likelihood and cost of conflict, which is one that I'm intimately familiar with. And I'm sure many other people are intimately familiar with. Um, I loved it safe. Uh, was there anything else that you had on the, on the, uh, cost benefit analysis or something else that you want to highlight with respect to that? 
Yeah, I think this is it in terms of the fiat because what, with the fiat cost benefit analysis, I do a, an analysis of fiat versus gold. So fiat saves us a lot of money on uh, moving gold around, but it gives us a government that is basically indomitable and can take 14% per year on average and um, uh, is able to sh reshape the market and economy and it destroys your ability to save. It destroys businesses' ability to function normally because the currency is so destructive. You know, look at places like Lebanon and imagine the kind of uh, problems businesses there have. And then you've got... Um, and then you've got, yeah, the cost of conflict, I think, is an important one. Uh, this is the thing, like, being in power just means you're able to print money. You have the control node. You decide what's real money. You decide who gets to print money. You get an enormous amount of power. And that just has made the 20th century extremely bloody. I think it's it's something that um, is probably worth writing a lot about, you know, thinking about how much of the world's wars and U.S. foreign policy is motivated by, um, is motivated and financed by, uh, this horrible software implementation that is the fiat network where the central bank uh you, you remember you asked me for about the four functions earlier let me so let me mention these yeah, yeah. uh so the the central bank um the central bank government the government gives the mon central bank a monopoly on printing money the central bank prints the national currency and provides the, the currency supply regulates the banking system and controls what banks are able to do and buys government bonds and so therefore finances government and also get this <laughs> amazing feature in our new uh, fiat implementation it allows the central bank a monopoly on the clearance of international trade because what worse possible engineering decision could you put than could you ever make let's put the government and all of the country's savings and the central bank uh, sorry, and international trade in the hands of one central bank and give it a monopoly on doing all of these jobs. So only it can do this because effectively what it's doing is that it is uh, subsidizing government's spending through using the world, the, the entire country's uh, international trade and local uh, savings as collateral. That's essentially it. That's like what you see happening extremely transparently in a place like Lebanon, well, where you know the government goes bankrupt and then suddenly the bank money has disappeared and people are still asking their bank where their money is, and it's 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 amazing. Like watching a lot of these uh, people, um, you know, still think that the issue is that the banks took the money and ran away. And, and I'm sure some bankers, of course, took the money and ran away, but it's as if, you know, they had all this money in the central bank and, and bankers just took it and ran away with it. When the reality is that money was never really there. It was just part of a Ponzi used to finance government. That's where your government has been spending all the insane amounts of money it's been spending over the last decades. That's where your savings went. And uh, that's what fiat does. And that's what has financed war everywhere around the world. I think um, the world would be a lot more diplomatic and a lot more peaceful if uh, governments had to uh, take responsibility for their spending rather than just crank up their printers all the time. All right. This is my last question for you. Um, what do you see debt looking like if we would move into a Bitcoin standard. I think it would be. Um, I think it would be a, a heavily more equity world. I think uh, I, I discussed this. Uh, I discussed this in uh, the penultimate chapter of the book. I think Bitcoin basically um, eats the incentive for fiat mining. You know, it basically makes. It's it's like somebody figures out a way to make SHA uh, SHA twelve. 256 hashing uh, worthless. And so now your computer can figure out a new solution, but it won't get paid for it. That's what Bitcoin kind of does for fiat. It makes mining no longer profitable. It makes lending no longer uh, like mining. But it's not that it makes mining no longer profitable. It makes lending, um, it, it, it separates lending from mining. It makes lending a static process that does not create money. So in order for me to lend you money, I have to take money from my hand. I can't just create money, even if I'm the government's friend. I don't get to just print money because I have a license. I have to actually have, I have to be the one who pays the opportunity cost. You know, I'm the one who doesn't have that money available for me to um, enjoy. So that kind of world, I think investment would become equity focused. I think back in a world in which I don't see uh, investors wanting to take on uh, uh, 
take on investments that carry equity risk without getting equity return. I think this is the key point that the fiat system kind of distorts in that it offers you the illusion that you can be guaranteed uh, a 3% or a 5% or a 7% or whatever it is, that it's at the bank and the bank is guaranteed by the government and you get the specific amount of money, which there's no risk. You know, we put your money to work, but not a lot of work. And therefore we guarantee you that you're not going to be risked you're not going to get any real risk and there's no risk of losing all your money and you're going to get um, a five percent low interest uh, a five percent uh, no risk loan whether it's bonds or saving deposits or whatever it is this i think is just going to go out of business we're just going to have a system of deposits where you pay in order to have your money safely kept in deposit available for you on demand whenever you want it and not being involved in any kind of shenanigans. And we'd have a system of uh, equity where, because the, without the government, without the illusion of banking safety provided by government central bank monopoly, nobody can guarantee that a business will prov provide a uh, return of capital. You know, any business can go to zero. You know, it can go to zero, whether through liability, whether through natural disaster, whether uh, whatever it is, any business can go to zero, so your investment can be wiped out. And there's no running away from that risk for an investor. And the idea that investors should be doing this, I think is just a function of the f um, failure of the fee system to provide a, a saving function. Because people ha don't can't save, they have to go and uh, invest in a casino and then the casino wants to pretend, no, 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 it's safe, don't worry. You know, you'll make 3%, whatever happens and you won't lose your money. No, your money's at risk. So I think we'd go to a world of equity, much I, to fi Islamic finance, I think. I don't think uh, we're going to be dealing with interest rates of 1% to 3% or discount rates uh, in the low single digits for economic calculation when we move to something like that. It's fascinating. Hey, so this book, uh, here it is again, the, the uh, Fiat Standard by SAFE. Um, this thing, folks, go out there, read this book. Um, the, the research, the the amount of resources that you have in the back that just, I mean, dude, you crushed this. Um, and for people who are maybe listening, to this, and people are, I'm sure people are listening to this and are saying, wow, I, di I totally disagree with whatever take. I would seriously go read this, get the full uh, in-depth laid out uh, talking point and background and research that he has for some of these points. And, you know, maybe it, it'll just challenge whatever... Uh, you know, belief structure you might have and, and just provide a, a counterpoint to it. Safedine, is there anything else that you want to highlight or hand people off to? Um, I, I know you can find the book on Amazon and some other places, but um, anything else you want to highlight? Um, yeah, well, my website, safedine.com, you can also um, subscribe and become a member, take my online courses in Austrian economics and Bitcoin economics. And you can also um, get a preview of my next book, uh, Principles of Economics, my economics textbook, which is on its way to being done, very close to getting done. And uh, yeah, um, you can also buy the Fiat Standard from my website. And I'm also pretty active on Twitter and also my podcast, the Bitcoin Standard Podcast, your podcast crowd. So if you're into podcasts, subscribe to the Bitcoin Standard Podcasts. We have these seminars that are for students in my website. People sign up for my courses. You can join the seminar twice a week and then um there's also the uh and then we have guests like preston for instance and we've just had michael sailor we're going to be releasing it uh, i think just today um so yeah um I look forward to hearing from you we'll have links in the uh, show notes for everybody to uh, check all that out and safeting thank you so much for coming on the show always a pleasure thank you so much for having me preston take care